My name is Deirdre Gilbert, and for those of you who don't know me, I am the founder and the national director of the NMMAA. I will be facilitating the post-screening discussion today. The NMMAA and Malpractice Diaries. The NMAA, as I stated, is called the National Medical Malpractice Advocacy Association. And basically what we do is assist those that have been harmed by medical error. Recently, we created a platform called Malpractice Diaries, where we allowed the stories to be told that were kept secret. And so we were allowing those that had stories of medical malpractice in some fashion to tell what they keep secret. I would like to introduce to you our panelists for today's discussion. We have Kim Wistack. Hi, Kim. Hi. We have Maria. Michael Elbaum. Hi, Michael. And we have Angela Peacock. Hi, Angela. Hello. Now, I'm going to pass to each panelist so that they can more formally introduce themselves and give some brief thoughts on the film. While the panelists are introducing themselves, the audience can go ahead and start typing questions in the Q&A box so that I can begin posting those questions to the panel as soon as those introductions are done. Kim, you may begin. Great, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Kim Witzak and I am a national drug safety advocate. I um, have got involved in drug safety work, not by choice, but uh, almost 17 years ago, my husband was given an antidepressant for insomnia with no history of depression. Five weeks later, hung himself. And at that time, there were no black box warnings that you heard about in the film. And so I worked tirelessly with others to get black box warnings put onto these drugs. And today, I actually sit on the FDA Psychopharmologic Drugs Advisory Committee as the consumer representative, um, reviewing drugs, new drugs that are coming to market, that um, many of them that we will be seeing eventually down the road that'll be advertised, but that are based on a lot of the same um, drugs that we're seeing in the film today. So um, thank you for having me. Um, and I'm excited to be a part of this panel. It's a great panel. Thank you. Hi, Michael. Hi. All right, so I'm Michael Baum. I'm uh, the managing partner of a law firm called Baum Headland that um, has been for about 30 years leading a lot of the litigation against pharmaceutical manufacturers, in particular uh, the psychiatric drug manufacturers of uh, things like Zoloft and Paxil and Selexa, Lexapro, uh, Prozac, and uh, was probably more or less instrumental for getting the black box warnings in place for the suicide warnings, the withdrawal warnings, and birth defect warnings on SSRIs. Um, and uh, so we've litigated uh, uh, the ghost writing and the manipulation of science, uh, gotten those documents declassified and posted them at, at DITA, it's uh, University of uh, California, San Francisco, and have done as much as we can to get that data, data out. But it is a, uh, takes great movies like this and people participating in them like Angie uh, to get the more of the word out. And it's an incredible job by people like Kim Witzak who take those documents that we got declassified in binders around Congress and go and tirelessly goes into uh, congressmen's uh, offices and says, look at these documents. What do they show? She's relentless. She's been awesome. Thanks, so that's all. And Angela. Hi, I mean, you saw a lot of my story in the film. I'm now uh, almost five years off all medications and I still suffer from some neurological damage from the drugs and the long-term use. Um, but with my healing, or during my healing, I did the film, and then I did a master's in social work, so I kind of could learn the mental health system language and try to fight back and find a place within that system. 
but I decided um, to not get licensed as a clinical social worker just because there were so many things I just could not, you know, ethically swallow, I guess. So I'm still healing. I'm traveling in an RV. The pandemic kind of ruined some of our screenings. So I don't, I'm not able to do in person, but we do virtual now. And that's about it. I'm just um, continuing to take care of myself and hope that I'll get better. But um, definitely long lasting effects from the drugs and from the trauma caused by coming off the drugs and all of that stuff. So I'm happy to be here. Excited about this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Okay, so we have a question. It says, do you feel that there would be more cases for medical negligence for benzodiazepines? I feel frustrated by the idea that if a generic was taken, it is pretty much impossible to make a case. I was, I'm also was harmed at age 17, 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. However, my knowledge of discovery didn't come until about two years ago. I know you cannot give official legal advice, but how can future victims protect themselves in the future? So that's kind of like a two prong question there. Well, that's, that's one of the big catch 22s of pharmaceutical litigation now is that in almost every state, uh, you are barred from uh, bringing claims against the generic manufacturer for uh, defects in the label that the brand manufacturer made. And uh, the brand manufacturer, when you bring a lawsuit against them, says it wasn't our pill, it was that uh, generic manufacturer's pill, so you can't bring a claim against us. And then you try to bring a claim against the generic manufacturer and the generic manufacturer says, this case says we, it's by the Supreme Court, says we're not liable for what's in the, in the label, the brand manufacturer is. So this, it's a gigantic loophole that uh, people fall into. There's still uh, the possibility of bringing cases in California uh, against a generic manufacturer under the Conti case. And there's a couple of states where you can still maybe do it. We almost got all the way through uh, the Court of Appeals and Supreme Court on a, 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 Paxil su a generic Paxil suicide case that Kim, a friend of ours and client of ours, um, husband committed suicide uh, while on generic Prozac. And we pretty much got that all the way through uh, on the generic issue against GSK, the manufacturer of Prozac. So there's still some avenues. They're very difficult, very difficult to find a lawyer to do them because they're very expensive and difficult cases. But it, they, they can be done in certain places. Angela says, can you say more about the issues that you may still be dealing with as a result of the medication? And I have so much admiration for your strength and determination. Oh, thank you. Um, mostly it's like, a, it's, it's, I can't even describe some of it because it's so out of the norm of like normal experience, but I will say I've been to every doctor possible. And every time I go, they say, we can't find anything wrong with you. So that leads me to believe by process of elimination, what else could it be but the way the drugs affected my nervous system. So um, mostly it's like, uh, I have really loud tinnitus ringing in my ears. I have vision disturbances. So I see things in slow motion. Um, my balance is off, my vestibular system is off. There's like a mismatch. So when I walk, everything kind of feels off. Um, uh, like going into a store with a lot of loud, you know, visual stimulus, it's like overwhelming. Um, I have problems like with social, too much stimulation, basically. Anything that's stimulating is like, it's too much. My system can't handle it. And so the way I think about it is like all the drugs, whether whatever one you pick, they're either stimulants or depressants. So my system was depressed for 15 years and now it's not. And all those chemicals that allow you to act normal are not really there because the drug was in its place trying to do that for you. So then the body like forgets how to do that on its own. 
and you just have to wait and wait and wait and wait. And I've been through like 18 months of vestibular rehab um, with the physical therapy at Washington University Medical School, like the best medical school there is. Um, I've been diagnosed with like visual vertigo. Um, I went under, I went, I did brain injury rehab and I only improved like three points out of 100. So I do all kinds of like, I don't know, diet, lifestyle things, but really time has been the only healer for me, not anything that I did. So I'm just, I just like wait for my body to write itself. Thank you. This question is for Kim. Kim, how important is reporting adverse drug effects to the FDA or any other regulatory agency in other countries? Uh, first of all, it's a great question because I think one of the things, it's very imp important. Um, it's very important, but the reality is probably less than three to 5% of all adverse events or harms ever get reported. So by law, the drug companies, if they, um, if they know about it, it's supposed to go to the FDA. Um, your doctors are supposed to um, uh, report it, but there are things at the FDA called the MedWatch program. And there's also one for devices where you can actually go on and report your own side effects. In my mind, I believe, and I've always said this, that that should be a signal for the FDA when they start seeing harms that are reported, that they're able to um, look at for asking the companies to do further studies. They can be doing more um, studies, as well as it re um, it's a data um, base for researchers and lawyers and things like that, that they want to go and see what's really being reported. Because at the end of the day, you know, I have said, I've now sat on the FDA and I've gone through several new drug approvals and seeing how very few people are actually in the clinical trials to get these drugs approved. Ultimately, you and I the, are the public, or we are the ones that are the true guinea pigs that um, there might be some things that will not be seen in the clinical studies that are designed to get approval, but will uh, potentially eventually come out just like they did with the suicides and even um, just like some of the many things that Angie, um, Angela is just talking about and we're seeing in the film. These things have been known. And so if people would report them to the FDA, it's really hard to ignore, um, <clears throat> ignore them. But a lot of people do not, you know, they think, oh, what's the use? Or they assume somebody else is going to be reporting it. But I would say it's extremely important. And there's a website um, or there's a link on the FDA's website, MedWatch. Okay. Can, I piggyback, can I piggyback off of that really quick? Because there's another question in the Q&A about what motivated the new FDA black box warning on benzos. Okay. And I want to tell you, because two years ago, I was volunteering with Benzodiazepine Information Coalition. And we literally went down through all the support groups and said, you have to, you have to uh, do a MedWatch report. And we helped these people do their reports. And that was two years ago. And I think we filed over 1,400 reports within a short period of time. And they just put a black box warning to, what is it, a week ago about uh, severe withdrawal effects may cause dependence and addiction. They keep using that addiction language, but most of these are people that take benzos for 30 years because their doctor told them to. They don't take more than is prescribed. I never took more than was prescribed. I never abused anything. I just took it like you're supposed to. But anyway, so they did listen. We were very shocked. I can't say it was all because of our hard work because there was a thousands and thousands of already reports in there but they did just change it. So that's someone. I think it's, I was going to say that I think that's really important. Um, I've heard the same thing with um, devices as well as some of the mm -hmm. ones that have had big litigation um, such as Esher. So it was really important. Um, are people like you and I out there that are able to do something and, and better to do something than nothing at all. That's really incredible, Angie. Nice, nice work. Mm -hmm. from, and from, from our beds, sick, suffering from withdrawal, people typing mm -hmm. and calling and, Helping each other. I mean, we have to do what we can do, you know. And I think that's amazing. I do have another question here. This person says they were on various antidepressants for 20 years since they were 14. They want to thank you for the documentary and your work. They would like to know how do we find doctors that actually probably believe in what we say and can help? Um, this is not to anyone specifically, but I'm, I'm going to say, Angela, how were you able, I'm guessing, to find uh, 
that help I, you need it? Finding, well, first I'll say um, I'm a part of many, many support groups. There's a whole bunch of support groups online for people yeah. just like me that came off or were thinking about coming off for various reasons, pregnancy, you know, change in plant life situation, whatever. Um, and so there's all these support groups online. I could probably show you 100,000 cases like mine right now, just like a Google search. So uh, those groups are like kind of like community organizing tools. So on one website, I would say Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, there is a list of doctors that are smart about benzo tapering, but they're, they preface by saying, this is a list of doctors, you know, we cannot vouch for them. We can't say that they're absolutely going to follow a safe tapering protocol, but they are more educated than most. Okay. Then there's another website called um, In International Society for Ethical Psychiatry and Psychology. Mostly it's therapists, but I always send people there too. And then on our medicatingnormal.com website, if you look under alternatives and resources, we have a couple providers there that do like um, telepsychiatry that are wise about tapering but just like the film said in an easy google search we'll we'll figure this out doctors are not are not um, educated on safe tapering and safe tapering means at my pace symptom based on my symptoms how fast or slow i need to go and what decision i want to make about how fast or slow depending if i have to work or i have to raise children or stay functional or all those things so if, if you talk to this is really scary but we, a lot of people in the groups don't tell their doctor because the minute you tell them that you want to come off, they either take that as a sign of another mental illness that you don't, you're not thinking straight, or they take you off extremely fast, like an opiate style taper where it's half this week, half next week, and then you're off the third week. That's really dangerous for a lot of people. This, I'm talking about homicide, suicide, akathisia, where you can't stop moving, tardive dyskinesia, like all these things that Michael uh, sues for, you know? So coming off that fast is like dangerous. So in absence of medical help, people have created their own way to taper that's safe and like time tested for 30 years of people tapering because there was no medical help. So uh, the latest website is the Withdrawal Project, mm -hmm. which falls under Intercompass uh, Initiative. It's a simple Google search. It's also on our website where it shows like, these are how you taper safely. There's different methods, like some that you saw in the film. And that's again, a personal decision, talk to a pharmacist, but a lot of patients are left to their own device to taper at their own speed, at their own rate, watching their symptoms, getting support from peers. And then when they're off, they just tell the doctor, thank you, I don't need your services anymore. And that's just yeah. what, what we've come to. Wow. I was gonna say, it's really, it's shocking when I hear that because yeah. uh, you know we're out there on the other side um, fighting before they even come to the market, right? And I'm shocked at how much doctors do not, are not even aware at the time of how the FDA works and how drugs are even coming onto market with fewer and they fewer studies and then, or they may or may not even know the issues. And so when people like, you know, you go in and you complain about something, they automatically will start putting on, they'll put, say it's your mental health or your illness getting worse and they start layering on top of it. So. I, um, you know, I, it's just, I think patients, um, there's a lot of wisdom in, in patients. And when I, it absolutely drives me crazy when I hear a doctor say, act like they know more, but, you know, so I, um, know that there are a lot of those support groups out there and, um, and there's nobody better than the people who are living it and have survived it like you. So yeah. you're a Even huge you yeah, yeah, even like YouTube, if you search on YouTube for benzodiazepine tapering or tapering effects or, or whatever you want, there's videos of people, it looks like Breaking Bad in their living room, like with a beaker and, you know, it's crazy. And I never would have thought this, I mean, they didn't teach me this in social work school or psychology, my undergrad, nothing. This is like, I couldn't believe it when I saw it, you know, like this is what people have to do. So I just wanted to like comment on a couple of things that both of you were talking about. One is... Uh, one of our experts that we used in the uh, withdrawal litigation was Dr. Joseph Glenn Mullen, who wrote the book, The Antidepressant Solution. And he gives a sort of a system of withdrawing, which was similar to the woman who described how she got off of lorazepam. But it's, um, could have, uh, this, the system could apply to any of the psychiatric drugs, I think. And he's, He's a very knowledgeable guy in this area, so that's one. Number two, the VA uh, has 
been implementing very uh, progressive um, uh, non-drug solutions to PTSD and pain and have been uh, actually spearheading some of this science that shows that things like mindfulness uh, meditation, um, acupuncture, acupressure, things of that, like the bat, have you heard about the battlefield? Yeah, uh, combat, acupuncture? combat acupuncture yeah, or something. Yeah. Like put it a hole in your ear, like right here and here. Well, they, they, it, they find like, they, they find these Perfect. points and they can actually stop pain on the battlefield with no medications. Wow. And things similar to that uh, also help with some of the um, uh, neurological side effects that you may be experiencing, for instance, from um, what you're going through. So uh, the VA has, has some people, there's some really cruddy ones that would just drug you up and put you in a cocktail and make you stay in the cocktail in order to get your benefits. Or there are the ones that are out there that are really trying to steer the VA away from medicating normal or medicating, you know, the crazy, I mean, it is appropriate to feel very disturbed by what you go through in wars and war zones. And um, so there are, there are methodologies for addressing that without drugs that are way healthier and they're going that direction. And so I, I would, uh, Angie, I'd recommend that to everybody because I think that, that is and the path. Here's a question. Um, she's wanting to know about new training for therapists or psychiatrists that might be able to do this holistic um, treatments. Is there anyone that you all know of, uh, you know, a website or those things? Because again, as you just stated, um, people are headed that way. In so the if you go to the, the if you're a vet, go ahead. If you're a vet, you could go to the VA and uh, Google VA holistic health or integrative health, and there's um, a, a network of therapists in the VA that are uh, go, are are set up to do that and are trying to create clinics just for that. Great. Yeah, and for a civilians, it, you, I would look toward functional medicine, which is pay out of pocket, insurance yes. usually doesn't cover, or holistic and integrative psychiatry, those two. But again, you have to be careful because some will still give you antidepressants or whatever, and then they'll give you supplements or lifestyle changes. Some aren't sure about tapering. So I always tell people to ask the question, like, what do you know about antidepressants? And like, just be quiet and let them answer. Or what do you know about antidepressant tapering? Or what do you know about getting off of benzodiazepines? Or what do you know about getting off of antipsychotics? And then just shh, be quiet and just let them answer because their answer is going to tell you a lot. If they don't say slow taper based on the patient need, run, get away because <laughs> you don't want to be ripped off, you know, but it's not accessible for a lot of people because I mean, I've paid functional medicine doctors. I've probably spent what, like $600 for an initial one hour visit and then it's like $250 an hour. I mean, I'm broke just going, you know, to a doctor. So it's not accessible, which is what, where the peer support groups come in. People learning about these things on their own, learning alternative ways to treat mental health problems. Yeah, those are great. And another thing, another series of cases I worked on that are not directly related to this, but it's uh, the Roundup, the, uh, uh, the Monsanto Roundup cases. And then the, doing the research on that, uh, Roundup is the stuff that's in foods that are not organic. You know, all, you know it's your wheat that's been processed and they uh, soak it uh, to help the harvesting. It's in the GMO foods. They soak uh, the crops with all the G GMO crops with the weed killer. And it is an antibiotic that uh, in particular disturbs the microbiota in your gut. Uh, some of the big research that's occurring in psychiatry over the last five or six years is the relationship between uh, your gut and your mood, and that there's a direct correlation to dysbiosis, the uh, um, 
microbiota in your gut being out of whack and depression, anxiety, sleep disorders, and things of that sort. And if you are not eating organic food, you are consuming something that's killing your good microbiota that affect your mood. So a thing to do would be to avoid non-organic food that has uh, some of this stuff on it that um, disturbs your microbiota in a negative way. So uh, eat healthy, eat organic, uh, exercise, because that'll help promote uh, generalized health um, in general, uh, and uh, try to sleep, do basic things like that and do mindfulness meditation and some of the acupuncture stuff, find um, uh, ways of um, using the gradual system for coming off. Don't self-medicate with things like alcohol and uh, um, any, I, I would not self-medicate with anything if you can avoid it, but gradually come off stuff that you're on. But there, uh, changing the, your diet and your exercise habits and the stuff that you eat actually kills good microbiota. So it'd be a good thing to eat organic. And, and, and yeah, I just want to yeah. piggyback off that, that. That was one of the hardest lessons to learn was, okay, there's no pills to take. So what are you going to do? Your trauma is still there. Your emotions, you know, depression, all that. I would probably meet criteria for tons of DSM diagnoses that I don't even want, you know, but like, what am I going to do now? So I had to learn all those coping mechanisms that I did not get to learn because I was so medicated and I have to work on diet and I have to do sleep. And just last night, it's funny. I uh, woke up at, I wake up three times a night. Still, I have like sleep apnea and all kinds of neurological problems at night, but I woke up three times and I said to, to myself the last two nights, you're not turning your phone on. Do not let your eyes see the light of the phone, like go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I had to lay there and just like concentrate on, okay, my bed feels warm and soft. And I just focused on that and I fell right asleep. So even, you know, I am constantly working on myself. I leave my windows open so that I awake to the sunrise. You know, there's all these things we can do where you don't hand your body over and expect somebody to fix you. So that's the hardest right. lesson I've had to learn is darn it. If I would have done all these things, I would have saved myself 17 years. Well, and I was just going to say, um, now seeing with COVID and, um, and Corona, um, the coronavirus and the increase in mental health, um, there's a lot of people that are going into the system right now. There's um, the anti-anxiety drugs have gone up 34% um, since the start of COVID and the, the easy telemedicine being the quick fix. And I think it is a really good message. Um, the, the things that you, both you and Michael were talking about uh, are, are different ways of dealing with cope, um, coping with stresses and anxiety and pain because you know one of my favorite lines of the movie, and I've seen this movie several times and it gets me every single time. At the, you know, there's two things. The one at the, at the end, um, Angela, when you're back at dealing with the, the sorrow of grief and seeing your, you know, and all of that pain that was still there, it didn't go away. And then um, I think it was one of the other uh, girls in the um, movie who said, oh, I'm off all these drugs, but my original problem is still there. So that is the crux of a lot of these medications and seeing what is happening at the FDA with the new drugs that are coming on the market. And let me tell you, they're coming fast and they're using things with less um, uh, clinical trials, the number of people that are in them. And they're using, um, uh, it, it, like there's a new Zyprexa drug that um, basically was a drug that uh, the FDA just um, looked at, reviewed a couple weeks ago for Zyprexa. And um, a combination of Zyprexa as well as um, Samodorphin, which is an opioid um, antagonist, and it's a combination drug, but they're using a new pathway to get drugs approved. So basically, if one of the drugs is already on the market, they're assuming that the FDA has already done the efficacy and um, safety profile of that drug. So they don't need to go and study that. So in this one with Zyprexa, and the whole thing was about um, just uh, that you don't gain as much weight. Well, you know, in knowing all the background and the things that I've been doing about, you know, in the past 17 years of this work, um, Zyprexa has had a lot of issues. And just to assume that because the FDA approved it, that they don't need to go and do further studies on that part of the drug combination. 
and it's a pathway that exists and everything that's happening at the FDA is now about faster, quicker, and again, um, the real uh, clinical trials, when it gets to you and I, and it's advertised to millions. And so I always say, go look and see what lawsuits are happening. Um, and you know, some of those will probably not be into the lawsuit um, arena to Michael's area until you know, years from now. But I mean, it's a really scary thing. And, and then at the end of the day, all, you know, you're dealing with, um, and yes, there are some people that have extreme, you know, that are, that do and may need the drugs, but the reality is um, a lot of the reasons why we're getting them is people are just the quick fix, um, wanting something to take it away. And sometimes it's the hard thing that we have to go through. And, you know, um, I have a lot of admiration when I'm listening to these stories because it's just, it's heartbreaking. So the question here, uh, and it's probably Michael or Kim. So with what you just said, how reliable would the FDA be? And it seems so often that they are, you know, people can lobby them and, you know, the big money is there. It's, it's sort of like, as they said, a big revolving door. How do, how do you know, how do you curtail that? How do you curtail it? <laughs> I don't know if we can. <laughs> you know, with uh, that they are basically um, divided within them. There are very good scientists inside the FDA who are. Uh, it's a schizoid uh, a group beca uh, because there's the ones that view the pharmaceutical companies as the people who pay them through uh, the PDUFA Act. And so the pharmaceutical companies are their clients and they treat them like clients and they need to be pleased and uh, they can be easily intimidated by them because uh, the suits will come in and talk to your supervisor if you expose adverse events on a clinical trial that, that they don't want exposed. Uh, so it is a very difficult life that some of these heroes like David Graham or uh, Andrew Mossholder, who stood up to the pressure on uh, antidepressants and Avandia and uh, some of the anti uh, oral antidiabetic drugs. There are really good people inside the FDA, but they... Um, the FDA is a what we is a captured agency. Mm -hmm. So here's another question, Michael, that can piggyback on that. This particular person is talking about the suing of uh, you know to be able to sue. So eventually, the question is: is how do you um, you know do you think that this suing is resulting in change? Um, in the behavior of medicine, um, because again, this is, you know, uh, you can sue, but according to, as we were looking at the documentary, correct, um, it happens over and over again. So this particular person would like to understand, you know, is how, and, you know, is it resulting in a change? Well, I, I know that it, it hasn't created enough change, but uh, we did cause black box warnings, uh, withdrawal warnings, and helped get the, uh, the birth defect warnings uh, on the SSRIs. And that, that's the, the um, antidepressants like Prozac and um, Paxil and some and and Lexapro and, and to some degree Cymbalta. Uh, so it has made a change, but not enough of a change. And um, I was going to say, um, if I could interject, um, one of the things that I work with lawyers all the time, and I try to, because one of the things that I have loved um, from day one with working with Michael and Bob Headland is that they're advocacy lawyers and they really work hard to get um, documents out from under seal because really 
when you get those documents, it's not like, you know, my word or anybody else's word. It's like, it's company words, it's emails, it's the studies. And these documents in black and white are really, really important part of having to drive change. And so I think it's important that even the attorneys um, have some of that same type of um, kind of belief system that Bomb Headland has in getting those documents because that I think helps to drive change. And, and one of the things is to really start showing those even to uh, the, the FDA, to Congress. Um, and that's also why it's really frustrating when you hear that people have immunities and lawsuits can't be um, moved forward is because that is what is important so we can get inside the, the legal, like a lot of people think that the FDA or Congress can ask drug companies for documents. That's not how it works. They can ask for them, but the only way you can get these documents is through legal action. And so it's really important that we have the ability to hold these companies accountable um, and, and people like Michael and doing the work that they're doing. Great job. So Angela, um, one of the persons here is talking about the trust factor and wanting to know, you know, uh, how do you know who to trust, especially when you're hurting um, in this particular arena? And I'm guessing you probably can, you know, how, how did you get that trust maybe or? Yeah, I, th I think I read that question. Um, yes. It's really tricky because this is what I can tell you is that when you're on the drug or a cocktail of drugs and you feel suicidal, you think that's you. You don't think it's the drug. You know, here's an example. As I was tapering under a doctor's supervision, who wasn't tapering me the correct way, but that's beside the point. As I was tapering, I was getting increased anxiety. And I was like, why do I have so much anxiety? I don't understand. I'm taking anxiety meds. Like what, what is going on? So I thought it was caffeine. So I quit caffeine. This is like six years ago. Then I still had the anxiety. So then I thought, well, maybe I need to quit sugar, you know, and the couple cigarettes that I smoke here and there. I never once thought it's the drug causing this. But if you sit down and you read, just read the pamphlet, it's all there. It says withdrawal. It says suicide risk. But for some reason, it's like we don't, when it happens to us, we don't think it's the drug. We think it's us. And so when the doctor's telling you, oh, you're suicidal, let's put you inpatient. We'll switch your meds. We'll stabilize you. We'll send you home. You believe that. You believe that about yourself, you know, that I'm just a suicidal, broken person. But um, I wish you know, I said it in the film, like, I went to all these retreats, I went to all these places, I knew something was wrong, like, there was something inside me, like, I don't feel good ever, why don't I have good emotions, why don't I feel love for my dog, why don't, just like Dave said, why don't I want relationships with men, what, like, I was married before, I know what a sex life is like, why don't I have that now, like, all these little things were happening, and they happened so slowly, and so almost imperceptibly, that you they just like sl slowly snowball and then you become someone else that you're not like, right. this is not who I was 15 years ago when I was super soldier, had more awards than all of my commanders. Like how did I go from top soldier to, I don't leave my house for four years and I don't shower for two weeks at a time and I eat like crap. And how does this happen? But they kept blaming that's your mental illness. And I believe that because that's the narrative that they tell you, you know, I didn't know it was the drugs. So all I can say, and, and we're being really vague about the question because it was kind of a personal question, is just that you know who you are before and you know who you are now. And if those things don't match or, and are not explained by some other medical problem, chances are the drug is affecting you or your loved one. And again, a slow, responsible taper with lots of support and love and reassurance and healthy diet and exercise and sunshine and all those things, I think is the only way. I mean, uh, otherwise you have a lifelong of drugs and psych wards, which, which is not fun. Did that for 17 years. Okay, Angie, I totally agree with Angie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Michael, I'm not sure who this person is, and, uh, but it says that they want to know if you had any correspondence with Jim Ghosting. And it was truly amazing what he was able to expose in his book, the Zybrexa Papers. Right. Why isn't this making headlines? And it feels as though psychiatric drugs are receiving protective umbrellas not applicable 
to other medication involved in litigation? And can you say why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, the pharmaceutical companies uh, have a license to print money. And uh, through uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, through their uh, uh, prescribing gu practice guidelines that have been uh, created for sort of a re creating a reality that the way to deal with problems is to drug them. And they have PR companies who engage in very sophisticated marketing. And they make, uh, they uh, promote very effectively the idea that a drug will help you. And you just, all you gotta do is watch TV and every other ad is a pharmaceutical ad. And that results in uh, the content of news. Like if you watch 60 Minutes, most of the commercials are gonna be drug commercials. And if you uh, watch uh, your evening news, they're going to even like your most, what you think of the most progressive, smart, uh, innovative uh, t uh, news programs, or they, they're beholden to their advertisers. And I have a close friend who uh, knew one of, was, uh, um, knew one of the guys who's like the number two guy in the Murdoch, uh, Fox News industry, and um, they were talking about, well, why don't you let me come on to your uh, show and explain this relationship between uh, the pharmaceutical industry, commercials, and uh, misleading people about, you know, the adverse events and the ghostwriting and all that. And the, the guy says, I completely agree with you. This is nonsense. But if I were to let you on my on my network, I would get fired because of my advertisers. Advertising dollars really control the narrative on the, on computers uh, and on the airwaves. Uh, but I like uh, uh, Kim was saying, getting documents out every once in a while, you'll get an intrepid investigative reporter that's out there that just wants to expose something and they do it. And you know, getting the content out there, having people like Angie speak up, having Kim, people like Kim speak up, uh, they become a story. And I, th things like this have made a difference to uh, the VA. And the VA is the largest, most uh, respected in many ways, uh, medical system in the world. And they are moving in the direction of non-drug alternatives and validating with evidence-based medicine, that things like uh, uh, mindfulness meditation and yoga and um, uh, acupuncture and acupressure actually perform as well or outperform drugs. And those are better alternatives that you could go to. And, I, and it, 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 w there is a revolution occurring. We just have, to, we're having to live through this. I, I, I tell a story of a, uh, I was taking a deposition of a, a psychiatrist who had prescribed uh, Celexa to a young girl who was having weight issues and she ended up killing herself and uh, representing the parents. And I showed her all this stuff, all this, all this documentation that showed that the company would have manipulated the efficacy that they'd used unblinded patients to make it look like an outperformed placebo, that they had uh, used the four week or six week uh, periods of the trials to make it a, a point where they found things that they cherry picked where it looked like it was better. I showed that all to her and she said, oh no, well, the treatment guidelines I mean, tell me what to do and I rely on what my colleagues do. And, um, and that, and so, you know, this information, I don't see information like this. I, I rely on what my guidelines are to be violating the standard of care if I didn't do what the guidelines do. So we went round and around and around for like seven hours of this deposition. And finally, at the end of the day, we were done. I didn't really make any progress with her. And it's uh, dark out. And I'm out in the back of the, where, of the, this clinic. 
and I'm waiting for a cab to come get, come get me. And she walks up to me. She says, I know you're right. And I, the problem is, is I, I only have so many arrows in my quiver to treat adolescents with, who have depression. And if I, they knew that I was, uh, the, the arrow I was giving them was no better than a placebo, it, they wouldn't get the benefit of it. And so I need to have that arrow in my quiver. And so my response to them now is, you do have arrows in your quiver other than uh, Lexapro or, or Celexa or Prozac. You tell the kids, um, there's a book called, um, uh, oh, God damn it. It's by John Ray. Um, Spark. John. Oh, Spark by John Rady. I read yeah. that while I was going. So through it. it's, yeah. it, that's get out and exercise to a sweat. That'll help kids get off of antidepressants and ADHD drugs. Uh, mindfulness meditation, all these things that the VA is going for are good things to teach kids because it makes them more conscious of being here now, not conscious of the past, not anxious about the future, not regretting the past or dwelling in the past. Get here, get your mind here now and do eat well, sleep well, exercise well. Those things will outperform nearly all of the drugs. And that, that, that uh, uh, spark by John Rand is like great. And um, so those are my, that's I, hearing is my, uh, the epistle. <laughs> so well, and I was gonna say, I completely um, agree agree with that and i think kids or children are our greatest opportunity if we you know instead of um teaching them you know the one pill solution because as michael was talking i was thinking um so i've my professional job is i'm in advertising so i understand the whole advertising marketing game and i've also seen um so it's not just advertising um and to the doctors and to consumers and to journals medical journals um, it, it, they're also very, um, the companies are very smart and strategic and they, um, for an example, one of, there was a big FDA hearing on Chantex and what did the company do? They hired a PR company that placed editorials in every single one of the major newspapers of where the advisory members, um, were from so that they saw that smoking is a huge problem. So they set it all up. And so it's coming at all, it's literally coming at all different angles from like, there'll be editorials that are they even written by a person and they had real people writing them, but they weren't real people. And social media and watching all the groups and things that are happening on social media and controlling content. We use them all the time in my That's business. True. Um, yep, AstroTurf patient groups. Mm -hmm. And we use them all the time in my industry, you know, for different kind of clients. So I know that the company, drug companies are doing the exact same thing. And then to the point where Michael um, was talking about uh, guidelines, um, one thing that's, uh, I, you know, that I've had to educate my doctors at the clinics and stuff, and I think it's a really important thing, is there's a form that when you go into a lot of the doctor's offices, it's called the PHQ-9 form. And it's basically kind of your paperwork that you fill out, like, is this your insurance, et cetera. But it asks you a series of questions and because everybody's caring about mental health right now. And the questions are like, in the last two weeks, have you cried? Have you felt sad? Have you felt less than worthy? Have you ate too much or drank too much? Well, so you're filling out those questions, just thinking they're kind of harmless, but people don't look at the very bottom of that um, paper that says a generous donation by Pfizer Inc. And then there's three doctors that were created that helped create that document. And so they were all, so that's become now considered industry standard. And so what it really does, it kind of directs, it doesn't give you any place to put in, you know, the last two weeks, you know, I had a breakup, my dog died, you know, you don't have anything, you have no place to talk about life happening, but you fill out the paperwork and the numbers say, oh, you're looking depressed. And so what happens is it's a clear way into um, the start of a pathway into drugs. So I think it's really important to just start having, um, you know, even questioning. And I think it's really hard for patients and the public. I hear it all the time from people that they have a hard time questioning their doctors or even pushing back on doctors. Um, but, 
you know, uh, Angie, as you said, and I've heard parents say, and it, looking back, watching what happened to my husband, telling me his head was outside his body and he was only on the drug for um, three weeks, I should have, no, you know, knowing that was not normal. And so I think anytime something doesn't seem normal, there's nobody that knows better than you um, for yourself, but also your loved one. And so I think it's really important. So. So uh, we're almost getting to that time um, where we're having to come to a close. Mm. But there is um, a question that I uh, keep seeing that's sort of popping up. And basically, and it's a question that I have to across the board uh, as we deal with medical malpractice or this issue here of we have this revolving door of these companies doing what they do. Um, and it seems that we have the court system, correct, to do certain things. But what is it that can prohibit this cycle? Because I'm listening to the conversations of each and every one of you. Uh, and, and one of the big things that keeps popping up to me is that they know that they're wrong or they know that they're putting out dangerous drugs. And, and it's like, okay, it's all right. How do you... And I see you, Kim, because I think you know where I'm going. Uh, are you, I think you know what I'm saying is that we're looking at this and the people that are on this panel are wondering when it's going to get to a point where these people are actually held liable for putting out false information for one or manipulating data for one or, manip you know, putting, uh, having ghost writers for one. And it's almost like you're doing wrong and the wrong is okay. When will the wrong be done right? And when will it be to the point where we're saying, finally, someone's listening. Is it going to take us going to Congress to change a law? Or is it just gonna be a continuous lawsuits, continuous lawsuits, lawsuits, or are we going to continue to have people such as Angela and also you, Kim, like you lost your husband, where we continually losing patients or people are continually taking drugs who are going to continually be harmed? So that's the question that we would like to know. And this is, will be the last question. Well, I, I think litigation plus lobbying plus uh, people telling their own st stories, reporting to the, uh, the adverse event system. Uh, people like Angie who just, I, I, I don't know how you made it through, but uh, my hat's off to you. That was really amazing. And, um, but there are systems that are trying to make a difference in the right direction. Or there are people like Kim out there. She has friends on a network. She's expanding that network. There are um, the VA moving in that direction of mindfulness uh, and uh, you know non-drug alternatives. It is happening. But every person that's on listening to this uh, can, can do something about it. You can, you can do what Kim does. You can get some of these documents and go chart, uh, slap them down on, a, on your representative's desk and say, I want some, something done about these dumb guidelines. They have Pfizer writing them at the, at, with just no actual patient input, just you know, uh, doing a multiple choice response. It's, it can, there are things that can be done. And the other thing I want to say is that Everybody, everybody, uh, their basic self is, is good. And, and you need to, to have more faith in yourself and don't take drugs or 
self-medicate with excess alcohol or do anything like that uh, to the degree you can let that that basically great person come out from the layer of clouds uh, and don't create clouds that that will work that I think that's that's a way to go. I saw someone asking a question about what the books were. One is called Spark by John Rady, R-A-T-E-Y. And he recommends exercising to a sweat three times within 45 minutes. And if you can do that quickly, um, it, 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 it stimulates a whole bunch of great things. Uh, the other book was uh, The Antidepressant Solution by Joseph Glenn Mullen, G-L-E-N-M-U-L-L-E-N. -L -L -E and at that I shut up, I let the girls talk. Okay, and um, we're gonna wrap the discussion up. So let's start, Kim, we're gonna start with you, Kim, Michael, and then last, Angela. So uh, for a few minutes for closing thoughts here. Sure, uh, you know, I was gonna probably just piggyback on what you were just saying or the question you asked. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'm out there, I will be continue to be the voice um, sitting on these FDA panels. I was telling Angie earlier, it's really hard because I hear people, what people don't understand is a lot of times it's the drug company sponsored patients and patient groups that are at the FDA hearings that are saying they're speaking for patients. And it's really hard when they don't think that, um, you know, when you've lost somebody or you've seen people that have suffered, it's really important. Um, I am out there fighting for you and we need everybody. And I always get asked, what can I do? And, and I say, if you have a story, share it. Don't be afraid to share it because I think there is power and we have seen it from day one in doing all the advocacy work is um, your story and the truth does come out in the story combined with um, at, uh, the documents that's, that show it in black and white and what's happening. And let's get out there and start forcing things. And I'd love to personally see some of these company executives be held um, legally, uh, criminally responsible because I think maybe once people are held criminally responsible, and I know there's people have been out there trying. Um, and so then I would also say informed consent. Let's all advocate for con informed consent um, at the doctors. So. Uh, thank you for hosting this. And um, Angie, you know, I've told you a million times, like watching you and you, you guys are like my heroes because you're out there and you live with this every day. And um, so right. thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'll piggyback off that with my closing thoughts, just that I'm going to say something really radical. So buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> but the more, you know, there's a top down approach with waiting on the F Huh? With F bombs? Uh, yeah, well, no, I'll save that for later. You saw that already. But anyway, I'm trying to work on it, okay? But anyway, there's a top-down approach, you know, waiting for the FDA, waiting for Congress to save us. And there's the radical way, educating patients to stop, you know, to stop looking for this drug solution, this easy fix, because I guarantee you all you're doing is kicking the can down the road. The problems are still there. You're, and, and what I, a lot of people are kind of like defensive when they see the film, but the, the important thing, I, I cannot say this like more than I'm about to say it, that the suffering is real. The pain is real. Whatever you're going through is absolutely real, but to be sold a bill of goods that you have some mysterious brain disorder that just landed on you. And now you need to take a drug for the rest of your life is bullshit. Okay. So like look for other things. We need each other. There's this like medicalization of everything. So like if your kid is acting up, send them to a doctor. If your elderly person is yelling at the nursing home, give them a pill. If you you know, if your teen is, uh, I don't know, being angry, give them another pill. There's all these things that are like, there's reasons for them. The person's angry at the nursing home because they haven't got their diaper changed. The kid is angry because they have trauma at home. There's reasons that people feel the way they do and drugs are not the solution. So that's what I want to say. And then just the last word about the film. Somebody asked about when will the film be ready for purchase? We're right, right now we're in the community screenings phase. So it will be for purchase, but maybe six months to a year down the road. So if you, there's another action item, share the film, share our website. There's lots of screenings coming up. Um, we have videos on YouTube. Every day I post articles on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. So you can read all about these issues uh, just get involved. Do one little thing. Tell one person that you saw this movie or that you heard from the FDA consumer or that you heard from a lawyer. And I think we can change this. Okay. 
Thank you. Angela, do you want to say your final thoughts? That was and, it. Okay, <laughs> so was it. Me, that was it. Uh, you know, uh, so you your can, final thoughts. Where are they? <laughs> I just want to say thank you all for just coming on to uh, to the screening. It was an absolutely wonderful film, very well put together, uh, very heartbreaking, at, uh, none the least. And uh, again, just say thank you for all of the participants and all of your questions. And those questions that weren't answered, uh, maybe someone can give you those answers uh, on a sidebar and we can get those answers to you. And again, we just wanna say thank you for watching Medicating Normal. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. Have a good night. Bye.